Okay guys, let's talk about infectious inflammatory pulmonary disorders. Let's see how well we can cover all this. Okay, bronchitis. I think we've heard about bronchitis before, huh? Inflammatory response to the bronchial tissue caused by capillary dilation and edema of mucosal lining leading to exudate formation. It could be acute or chronic. So basically, there's an increase in mucic, mucus production. And of course, that makes you cough and you have spasms. And then whenever you have the bronchial spasms, that's a spasm of the bronchioles and you just can't seem to get enough of your breath. Um, it's aggravated by cold, dry, or dusty air. And the signs and symptoms are chest pain, fever, malaise. So these people that come in, we have to, they'll say that they have chest pain. So we have to figure out what exactly the chest pain is from. Is it from the MI or is it from pneumonia or quite possibly could it be from bronchitis. Um, so we're going to diagnose it by rolling out pneumonia. Um, we'll do a chest x-ray. If it does not show pneumonia, then we're going to go for with bronchitis. And we're going to treat them with a uh, broad spectrum antibiotic. So we're going to increase the fluid intake. Why are we going to do that? Well, you know, to thin out the fluids. And if you thin out the fluids in the lungs, then they can be able to cough it out. We're going to take over the counter analgesics. I'm going to take things like, well, any kind of NSAID because of the fact that they're going to be in pain from coughing so much, but we're going to take some other stuff. We could be taking Mucinex, we could be taking a cough suppressant, something like that. Um, of course, there we go again. Isn't that what we usually see is the importance of stop smoking? Um, people that are smokers tend to, well, let's face it, they have more occurrences of bronchitis, pneumonia, COPD, all the lung disorders, because, well, you're kind of putting your toxins into your lungs, and what do you expect, right? Anyway, pneumonia. This is the inflammation of the lung parachyma, which is the bronchioles and the alveoli. Um, it's the sixth leading cause of death, and usually it's the elderly that are dying, but it's also, it also could be the young, um, young immune suppressed. Okay, it could be infectious or non-infectious. The infectious will be bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, or other microbes. Non-infectious is basically the aspiration of gastric contents, inhalation of toxins, gases, etc. So it's the, it's not necessarily the bacteria that causes it, but it it is something that causes the inflammation. Okay. Now, under that infectious bacteria, we also have to think about you know, when people are in the hospital, that's the reason why they could get pneumonia because of the fact that they're in the hospital, they're not breathing like they should, we're not doing oral care like we should. So what happens? The bacteria just go in there and they just grow, populate, have a heyday, party time in the USA, and they cause pneumonia. So that's why we're very cautious that people don't get pneumonia while they're in the hospital. Okay, so there's community acquired. And that's by stress or influenza virus. There's hospital acquired pneumonia, uh, Staph aureus, Klebsiella, or Pseudomonas e. coli, or opportunistic. Now, the opportunistic is they're bacteria that's already found in your body, but because of your immune system, maybe they can overtake it. What other kind of opportunistic things are going on in our body? Well, C. diff, because you always have that bacteria in C. diff. But because we're killing all the good bacteria, the bac bad bacteria can overcome everybody and can cause massive amounts of diarrhea. What else is there? Well, let's think about thrush. We see patients that are in um, chemotherapy that get thrush. Thrush happens whenever you have, your, everybody has yeast in their body, right? So thrush happens whenever we can get rid of all the good um white count, get rid of the white count, and the yeast overtakes things, takes over, takes the mouth. It just has a heyday and produces all kinds of fun family members and causes quite a pain. It's a white coating in the mouth, um, but it's, yeast is usually in your mouth, but we're able to control it. When you're immune suppressed, you can't. Is there anything else that we can think of that could cause as an opportunistic I was thinking of one and wouldn't you know it just blew by my mind there was another one
crap, crap, crap. Oh, anytime um, you take an antibiotic for a yeast or for a UTI. I know women usually have this problem, but what happens? They end up with a yeast infection. So a lot of times when they're taking that antibiotic for UTI, they turn around and have to take some um, diflucan to get rid of the yeast infection caused by that bacteria. Okay, so pathophysiology, pathogen gender to the lungs and via expiration, inhalation, or through the bloodstream. Um, host defenses are overwhelmed and organizations colonize and take over. So then there's the immune inflammatory response, right? So what's happening? You have the inflammatory response that causes fluid to be into the lungs. Um, antigen antibiotic antibody response and toxins damage alveolar wall causing inflammation and with vascular congestion. Okay. Okay. So in the elderly, presentations in the elder may be atypical with reduced cough and speed in production. First signs of maybe fever, tachypnea, and decreased level consciousness. And that's where we'd probably get an ABG. If somebody comes into the ER and they're they're not as conscious as they used to be, then we're gonna we're gonna do ABGs and figure out what's going on. So we'll do EV, ABGs, we'll do CBC, CMP, and then we'll do a chest X-ray. And through that, we'll differentially diagnose, right? Because what else do we say if somebody has a decreased level of consciousness, other than the fact that they're breathing? But you know, when uh, you know, I think it was in Rita's class that every time somebody comes in an altered state, it could be a UTI, right? Especially in the elderly. Um, a lot of times with the UTI, though, I think they're more combative than anything, but they can have an altered level of consciousness, and it could be because of um, a UTI going into sepsis. But anyway, in infants, they're going to grunt, grunt. They're going to have the intercostal and subcostal retractions, nasal flaring, and that nasal flaring is basically they're running out of oxygen. They don't have enough oxygen, so they're going to use every bit of their body that they can. That includes if they make their nasal passages larger, hopefully they can get enough oxygen in there. And then circumoral sinus may be present. What's that mean? Well, that basically means around the mouth, um, they're going to be a little bluish. Complications, expansion of infection to pleural, the pleural... Uh, Membranes, atelectasis, pleural effusion, lung abscess, necrosis, and pus formation within the lung itself. And we'll talk about a little bit of that later. Pericarditis, sepsis, and pyema. Um, and pyema is a accumulation of pyrrolytic exudate within the pleural space. And basically, what an pyema is, um, it's like a big walled off ball of pus. Um, it causes quite a bit of problems, okay, because A, if you just go in there and grab that ball of pus and it explodes, what's going to happen? It's going to cover that whole lung, and we can't have that because we want to keep it encapsulated. So what they might do is they might do some really heavy antibiotics to see if they can't low, decrease that empyema, but it's encased. So it's a hard, it, it's real hard for that um, antibiotic to work. A lot of times they have to go and get it out. They'll do, they'll go in, um, and they, they go in with, um, I'm trying to think, video assisted, that's what I'm thinking, video assisted um, thoracotomy to go in to grab that empyema and pull it out. Very tricky. Um, there's been cases where I know they, it was an empyema, they, it was a prisoner they were having a hard time. They couldn't, you know, the, I guess the, the pulmonologist wasn't a very good pulmonologist, went down, saw what he thought was just like a mucus plug or I don't know what the heck he was thinking. But anyway, he went down and he went to do a biopsy of it. It opened up. It went all over that man's lung. He ended up dying a few weeks later because of it. Because if you can imagine all that pus going all over the lung, and then, oh my God, right? It's nice, warm, it's wet. So that bacteria that's all over the lung, that's, that's going to have a heyday. And it's going to be hard to figure out how to get that out. And hard to get that 
patient on the road recovery. Okay, so here's your lung. I like, kind of like, or I'm sorry, here's your chest. I kind of like this one, this picture, because it tells you all the different parts that you can have. I should almost make that a little bit bigger, but too late now. Um, it shows you all your different This looks like a nice lung. The heart's kind of small. Must be a man. Just kidding. Um, heart's kind of small, but you see all that dark area. All that dark area is air, so that's good. Then we have pulmonary edema. Not much air going on. And if you look, the heart's really big. So what possibly could have happened is that they were in CHF and then everything backed up and made it pulmonary edema. Okay, and this is, looks like pulmonary edema, or infiltrates. You see how it's infiltrating to the side, that white? It's just coming from the heart and it's backing up, it's starting to back up. And if we don't take care of it, that patient's going to end up with pneumonia or pulmonary edema. Put, a, put an x-ray out there that shows a bat wing and it would be for a GEP point though. So what do we have? Tell us. Legionnaire's disease. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it happened... Um, you know, American Legion, well, they had a big old heyday convention and they were all in one hotel doing what Le Legionnaires do. I guess they go around party. Um, anyway, a lot of people came down with this, with this cold cough, whatever you want to call it. And they ended up dying and they couldn't figure out why, you know, of course they did everything they could. They did all the tests that they could. But they just couldn't figure out why um, these guys were dying. Well, I guess they did like a house kind of moment and went through the hotel to figure it out. What they found was the air conditioning was condensation, had condensation on the tray below it. And all kinds of different bacteria were forming. And it was anaerobic bacteria. Well, these spores were given out. Um, well, the spores were giving out toxins. The toxins was going through the air conditioning and it made people sick. So, question is, do we have Legionnaires today? I mean, we figured it out, right? Nobody should have Legionnaires, but yes, we do. Especially we find them, I think we had like two or three cases last year. What happened was they were in mobile homes with those old, um, I can't say old, but the window air conditioners, they had a tray underneath it so it wouldn't drip. Well, guess what happened? Bacteria formed, spores formed, <clears throat> went, the toxins went airborne and went right into the trailer. Now, a house you wouldn't expect it as much because a house is bigger. Well, most houses are bigger than a trailer. There's some that aren't. But there's more air to breathe. Windows might be opened or, you know, it seems like there's more flow. Whereas a trailer is kind of boxed in. And there's nowhere for that air to go. So that's why we get some sick people because of the fact that they're in mobile homes and they have that um, window air conditioner. So anyway, it's found the contaminated water. In fact, we had this huge, not, well, it's not huge. It was a really nice room up on fourth floor. And I guess if you were having a bad day or you just got done with a coat and you needed to chill, well, you went in there and it has this wonderful chair. I guess we should have done a field trip up there. It's a wonderful chair that's like a five thousand dollar chair and you just sat on it and massaged like every part of you and we had um a little waterfall and there we had some music and it was dim it was just really kind of a nice place to chill i don't think we used exactly what we were supposed to use it for but anyway um there was a little waterfall you know you see those at walmart you know and it just keeps on rerouting the water well, guess what? The infectious control sit there and said, heck no, you can't have that water. We could have Legionnaire's disease. So there goes our water fountain. Yeah. Waterfall wasn't a water fountain. It was a waterfall. It was a cute little thing, but oh well. I guess it's better to be safe. Anyway, so the manifestations are dry cough, dyspnea, malaise, chills, fever, headache, confusion, anorexia, diarrhea, malaysia, and arthralgias. Oh, and just... Guys, remember your medical terminology. Like, what's Malaysia and Arthalasia? Okay, let's go back and remember dyspnea, 
Latin is such a wonderful language. Unfortunately, they consider it a dead language, but we have to remember, because I know we've had trouble with those words at the last test, but guess what? I'm not going to be there for NCLEX. So, okay, high mortality left untreated in an immunocompromised patient, like 80%. That's kind of high, ain't it? Okay, mycoplasma pneumonia, classification as atypical as often it causes, causes pharyngitis or bronchitis, also called walking pneumonia. Now, before I got in the medical field, I thought walking pneumonia just meant that you can walk with your pneumonia and not have much of a problem, but I guess I was wrong. Um, patchy infl inflammatory changes in interstitial tissue of lung and of septum, often it Infectious young adults, military recruits, highly contagious. Why? Because they're in the same bunk day after day, you know, swapping germs, everything else. So it's able um, to procreate pretty rapidly. Okay. I would imagine that in the, it should be a little bit higher in the prison population too. But what do I know? Um, signs of symptoms are fever, headache, malaysia, arthralgia, dry, hacking, and non-productive cough. Okay, risk factors, emergency surgery, obstetric procedures. So what happens? Um, usually it's done in a fast amount of time, right? So people will be put flat on their back, their gag reflexes will be um, compromised because they have to you know, put a tube in your mouth to help you breathe. So your gastric contents go from your stomach up your esophagus and then end up in your lungs. That's why that happens. Depressed cough or gag reflexes. You know, whenever we say that it's going down the wrong tube, what happens? It basically goes down the wrong tube. But we're able to cough it out and it go down the right tube. Well, when people have cough or gag reflex problems, they aren't able to do that. Control nutrition. What does that mean? It may basically means that you have flu uh, nutrition going down your NG tube or possibly in a G tube. What are we gonna do? I don't care if you're going to lift that patient up, put them on flat on their back and lift the patient up and it's gonna take less than 10 seconds. You stop that tube feeding. Anytime you're gonna roll that patient or do anything with that patient, you must stop that tube feeding. What happens a lot of times is, oh, it's only gonna take a second, they won't aspirate. Well, guess what, hello, they will aspirate. So stop the tube feeding. Do what you got to do and then make sure they're elevated. Okay. They say, what is it, like 30 to 45 degrees, they must be elevated. You want basically their head to be elevated so that the gastric contents can't go right back up. Silent regurgitation. This happens with your older, their gag reflexes are a little off. So they think they swallow and there's a little, I don't know, pocket in the back of your throat that you think that. Uh, it kind of like, I don't know, it's like a two step swallowing and like you swallow, it goes into that little pocket and then your throat swallows again and it goes down your, down into your um, esophagus. But what happens with these silent regurgitation is only part of that would go down to the esophagus. Your body thinks everything's okay. It opens up and guess what? It goes down your, down into your lungs. Decrease LOC, right? Well, that makes sense. Because if you have a decreased level of consciousness, your cough and gag reflexes are probably a little bit depressed also. And post-CVA, this is not only post-CVA, but it's also, we got to watch out for aspiration pneumonia. Let me add a couple of it. Um, any kind of brain trauma, okay, car accident, um, post-CVA, anything like that. We've got to watch out for aspiration with pneumonia. We also have to watch out for um, epilepsy because we don't want the <coughs> epileptics to go into seizure. And if they go to seizure, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to have a hard time. Um, well, let me say, back up. When they go into seizure, what everything is going so fast that it could be problematic that the gastric contents goes up and goes down into the lungs. Okay, low pH of gastric contents leads to, leads to severe inflammation response. You put all that acid into your lungs, what's going to happen? Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to take over. So, CBC, pulse oximetry, ABGs, bronchoscopy. If they're having a hard time breathing, we're going to do the ABGs. 
um, for sure. But if it's if they still have level consciousness, not so much, I don't think, in a bronchoscopy. If a patient comes back with recurrent pneumonia, we're going to do a bronch, okay? Or if we're do, doing pneumonia and we're uh, using all kinds of antibiotics and it's not working, we're going to do a bronch, okay? We just don't say, oh, you have pneumonia, let's do a bronch, because, it, you know, it's a pretty invasive procedure. Now, medications. Initial med med antibiotics are based on gram stain results. Of course, if you don't have a gram stain result, you're going to give antibiotics broad spectrum. So we'll give everything that will cover a gram positive and a gram negative stage. Um, do, do, do. So we'll probably give them some erythromycin, myosin, or Cipro. Um, I hope you didn't hear my daughter just singing. Um, Perpacillin. We're going to do some bronchial dilators, mucolytics, and exporants. Other treatments, oxygen, we're going to increase their fluids. Now, it kind of gets dicey when you're talking about renal patients. Um, it's in spirometry, right? Chest, chest physiotherapy. So what does chest thera physical therapy was? Well, back in the day, it was nurses banging on the back of the patient's chest. But now we have this really cool vest that... Um, respiratory has and you put the, the vest on the patient and it basically beats the patient. It, um, I don't want to say pound because that sounds awfully rude, but it basically pounds and it hopefully will dislodge some of that mucus so that the patient can cough it up or get rid of it. Problem is, please make sure that you call your uh, telemetry check because what happens is it looks like V-fib on the monitor. And if you don't call your telemetry check, they're going to call your charge to say that you have a code going on in your room. So, yeah, make sure. Communication, communication, communication. Patient education, of course. Complete antibiotic regimen as prescribed. Stop smoking. Maintain fluid and nutritional intake. Symptoms to report to physician. Pneumonia vaccine. Um, maintaining fluid and nutritional intake. That's for your elderly. What happens with your poor elderly? Well, you know, maybe a spouse dies. There's no sense in making dinner for one. So they might just get a, I don't know, some oodles and noodles. And let's face it, even though those oodles and noodles taste good, they're not very nutritious. Um, and they just don't feel, they don't have any that drive. You know, why should I make a whole big meal just for me? And that could be really depressing. So we really have to look at those elderly people. Um, can't imagine, you know, living with somebody for 50 years and then not them not being there anymore. Um, so that's that's part of the social workers, um, you know, their forte and making sure that they have their um, nutrition. Okay, TB. Well, believe it or not, we still have cases of TB. And basically, hold on, basically, you know, they're usually from third world countries um, that come to the country and they're not in va um, vaccinated there, so they bring their, bring TB here. Um, and I can't think of one time that we had a TB case that the person was not born in the United States. We had one that he was here for a couple years. Granted, he was here in the prison population for a couple years. Um, but most of them are, you know, from out of country. And what's interesting is that even one was from out of country. He came and he was coughing up blood in his country, but he figured he'd have better results here. So he came into the United States, denied that he had any kind of symptoms. And of course, once he got a near brain, Guess where he came? To the hospital. Hmm. Anyway, chronic recurrent infection of the lungs caused by micro, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is a dropot, droplet nu nuclei. That being said, what kind of precautions do you think you have to use? Now we have to use a different mask, right? Because we don't want to inhale those droplets. Now, let's not get this confused. SSS, at SSM, 
we wear gown, gloves, and then was it N95 mask, which is like a respirator mask. That's what we use. That's what we always use. But the CDC say, states that all you need is a, the mask. So if you're going to give a patient a bath, by CDC standards, all you would need is a mask and gloves. And you're good to go to give that patient a mask or to give that patient a bath. Now, it is a special kind of mask that you have to be tested on. Now, I know you think I have a big mouth. Come on. Admit it. But, actually, I take a small mask. I know. My husband didn't believe it either. But anyway, I take a small mask. I kept on um, being rejected, failing these respiration tests until they figured out I have a small mask. Now, we have to be tested every year, and I have to admit I have to go get tested. But anyway. Um, anyway, uh, health access disparities, it contributes to the spread of TB, okay? So you inhale the bacteria, multiply, and form a lesion called a tubercule. When tissue inside the tubercule dies, forms a cheese-like center called a cessation necrosis. Um, the immune response for the patient, adequate scar tissue forms to wall off the back bacilli. Patient is infected but does not develop tuberculosis um, disease. So basically, it's in there, but it's not going to grow and make things worse. If immune response is not adequate, disease tuberculosis de develops rapidly. And I've had a couple students in class that they've had um, that walled off. The scar tissue walls off the bacilli. Um, reactivation re of tuberculosis can occur when the immune system. Oh, anyway, the immune response. So, if for any real bad reason their immune response goes low again, they're immune suppressed, then they have they could have a flare up of the tuberculosis. Okay, manifestations, fatigue. So, let me go back. Whenever we admit somebody, we ask them. Um, are you tired? Do you have any unexplained weight loss? Do you get night sweats? Are you coughing up blood? Uh, and if they say yes to two of these answers, then we put them in, in isolation, okay? Because we don't want a spread of TB around. Um, maybe asymptomatic until positive TB test or seen on X. Okay, now extra pulmonary tuberculosis may travel via the blood to other organs, and that's because the immune, um, they're immune suppressed and there is no, they have n nothing to fight, okay? Um, HIV pa patients are especially s susceptible, and there's complications, miliary tuberculosis, pleural tuberculosis, skeletal and spinal tuberculosis. Guys, you only have to know that, okay? Focus of care is early detection, accurate diagnosis. Is it TB? Um, I mean, we're talking about hemoptysis, right? They're, they're coughing up blood. Is it, or is it because of the fact that they um, have liver disease and they have the um, esophageal varices? That's why they're coughing blood. Or maybe they're they're dry and they've been coughing for so long that that's why they're coughing up blood. We have to really figure out what's going on. Um, effective disease treatment and preventing tuberculosis spread to others. Screening, we do the intramural PDDX. Um, we test within 48 to 72 hours. You've been there before, right? And we used to have to do it at the hospital. Every, on your birthday, that's what you did. You got your TB test. But they got rid of that because the CDC says if you only have so many cases of TB in a period of time that we don't have to do it every year. My understanding is though the um, long-term care facilities, you guys give your your patients TB tests every year. So it's kind of interesting why they do it, but yet we don't have to do it at the hospital. But anyway, there's a one step and then there's a two step procedure. Okay, so. We're going to get a sputum spare for acid fast bacilli. 
Uh, tuberculosis resists decolorization chemicals after staining used for rapid indicator. A series of three early morning sputum cultures are obtained. Um, chest x-ray, they find the lesion. And liver function tests, we're going to do that because the, in, the medication for tuberculosis is so heavy on the liver that we want to make sure that we're not killing the liver also. Okay, so we're gonna, before we even give them any of the antibiotics for the um, TB, we're going to check that liver out. Um, that's to be said for a lot of those medications. Um, if you get stuck by a dirty needle of a patient and they're going to give you on the cocktail or HIV so you don't um, end up getting it, they're going to check your liver also because everything is metabolized in the liver and we don't want to hurt your liver. But it's kind of interesting because even like um, if you get stuck by, if even if you touch blood of an HIV patient, they say your chances of getting HIV is very nil. So what they do is they turn around and they look, and they're not just HIV, but hepatitis too. They turn around and see what the statistics are of you getting that, that disease. Um, a lot of times it is so nil that they won't even do, uh, do any treatment for you because that's how harsh it is on your, on your liver. Okay. So it's just not worth it. Okay. We have the single drug therapy, which let's face it, wouldn't that be great? Because you know, you take one drug a day and boom, you're good. Unfortunately though, it's for six to 12 months. Ouch. That's a long time. We can't even take have one person take a medication for 14 days straight when you're going to tell them to take it for 6 to 12 months. But then we have the two or more drug therapies. And you have the INH, you have the Revampin, you have the Pizer, you love to hear me say this, Pyrazimide and Ethobutyl. All four drugs for the first two months followed by at least four additional months of Izionide and Revampin. It's a heck of a long time, isn't it? Anyway, most that we've seen is a single drug therapy, but that makes it tough. Six to 12 months and having them to do follow it. So what would you do if a patient is homeless? You know, how are you gonna make sure they're gonna take those, those medications for six to 12 months? Well, one thing you could do is you could make a deal with or set up a, a soup kitchen and have the soup kitchen give that medication. They come in for their noon meal and they get their medication. It's one way to do it because everybody got to eat, right? Um, but we really have to start thinking out of the box when it comes to this because they have to take it for six to 12 months. If they don't take it, they're not going to get better and they can, re they can infect other people. Okay, so we're going to close monitoring for um, hepatic, renal, and auditory side effects. Um, those anti-tubercular drugs have many drug interactions. Refampin causes the body fluids to turn red and orange. May permanently stay in contacts. Okay, may permanently stay in contacts, <clears throat> but not necessarily the skin or the sclera or anything else. Okay, so you have to really consider that. Oh, I can't think of how many homeless people have contacts, but okay. Compliance with medications is critical. Um, we had a guy that they didn't think he was going to take his medications, so they kept him in the hospital. He was that much of a risk because they let him out once. He didn't take his medication. He came back. I can't tell you how long he was in here because he was a health hazard. Okay. And when you become a health hazard, I guess we can pretty much dictate what what can be done and what can be said, right? Anyway, okay, infection control. So we have to re use a HEPA mask. Patient only has to wear a mask when transporting out of the room and visitors must wear protective isolation gear. Um, it isn't spread by inanimate objects, so that's why you can go in there without a gown. We feel com more comfortable with a gown, though. Um, if treated as outpatient, avoid crowds and close con physical contact 
for the first three weeks of treatment. Sorry. Um, teach importance of compliance with prescribed treatment for entire course of therapy. So remember, all they need is a mask. It doesn't have to be a HIPAA filtered mask. It has to be just a regular surgical mask to get out of the room. But the visitors must wear isolation gear. And quite honestly, we've every time we've had something like this happen, they've never had any visitors. So I don't know if they would um, make them go through the testing like we do or not. Okay, lung cancer, the cause of all cancer deaths, risk factors, increasing age, genetic predispositions, exposure to tobacco, smoke, and other chemical carcinogens. Of course, you've heard um, mesothelioma is one. And, um, of course, I think the mesothelioma is quite honestly through the, from the asbestos, but exposure to radiation inhaled in air tints such as the asbestos. They're looking at people that were in, um, that are in factories. Uh, we're talking about people that have been on ships like merchant marines. All these people have the capacity. Um, they have an increased risk of lung cancer. Smoking is more than 80% of the cases related to cancer, 10 times more common in smokers. Of course, if you live with a smoker that smokes two packs a day, it doesn't mean you have to smoke to get lung cancer. They're doing enough for you. Okay, types of, and you hear this on the TV, small cell, very aggressive, okay? Grow rapidly and spread early, um, adenosarcoma, Produce early metastasizes to the CNS, skeleton, and adrenal glands. Squamous cell is spread by local invasion. And then you have large cell. Large cell usually spreads really quickly. Um, lesions typically larger than adenosarcoma and tend to cavitate. Okay, manifestations related to location, spread of tumor, chronic cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, hemoptysis, dull, aching chest or pleuric pain, hoarseness, dysphagia, weight loss. Now why, if somebody starts coughing, do they not go to the doctor and get it diagnosed? Well, let's face it, if you're a smoker and you smoked how many years of your life, you probably cough anyway and you put it off. Well, maybe it's allergies, mm, maybe I have a cold, right? And then the cold turns into a month and you're still coughing and you forgot when's the last time that you felt any better. So usually, typically, it takes a while to be diagnosed because the person themselves might not so much be in denial, but they don't see it as a big problem. Um, with the weight loss, you know, oh, I lost some weight. I had to use another notch on my belt. Woohoo for me. You know, all these, all these symptoms can be explain to something else, and that's generally what our patients do. Diagnosis, chest x-ray, sputum for cytology exam. Um, we're going to do a bronchoscopy or a lung biopsy. We'll do a TC CT scan. Of course, there's a PET scan. Um, of course, that's basically the PET scan shows you where all the cancer cells are. Cytological exam, a floral effusion, thoracentesis sa sample. Um, they could do two ways of doing the lung biopsy. They can go and do the bronch or they can take them and do a lung biopsy from usually from the back. They um, just take a big needle and aspirate some fluid into that needle. Treatment, it depends how we're going to do this. You know, more than likely we're going to take out the cancer, right? Everybody wants it out, out, out. But think about it this way. We usually start with chemo radiation. And why is that? Well, if you take the if you take the the tumor out of the lung, you won't know. And then you start chemo to kill all the rest of the cells. You won't know if that chemo is actually working, right? Because you took it out. But if you leave it in and you start chemotherapy, and you notice that's not shrinking, then you know that's not the right um, medication, the right chemotherapy. So you can change up the chemotherapy to find out to see what's, what's going to make it shrink. From then, once it starts shrinking, then we can take out the tumor and then continue the chemotherapy to get all the cells that we were able to get out. Does that make any sense? 
you know, a lot of people want it taken out and then they'll start the chemo, but we have to see what chemo is actually working. Because if you take out that big cell, you know, those little cells are big tumor, then those little cells are around and it can move and propagate to other places. Okay. We want to make sure that the chemo actually is going to work. We're going to give them, them some bronchodilators, analgesics for pain. Um, it could be anything from PO, Vicodin to a fentanyl patch. And we're going to do complementary therapies, you know, acupuncture, aromatherapy. There's all kinds of therapies out there that um, people use. Surgical treatment, there's a laser bronchoscopy, of course, people kind of like that because it's not real surgery, right? Uh, Meniostinoscopy, thoracotomy, where we basically take part of the lung out. Wedge resection, segmental resection, lobectomy, and pneumectomy. Okay post op thoracotomy. So basically we're going in and we're taking out the lung. It's a pretty big dang deal, isn't it? So we're going to make sure that they have pain control. We don't, you know, everybody wants pain of a zero, but is that really realistic? Think about it. I mean, I know, oh, I don't want to have any pain. Well, you're not going to have any pain. You're not going to be able to breathe is my whole thing. So we want to give them enough medication that they're comfortable and they're able to do their ADLs, but we don't want to do enough too much where they're not going to be able to deep breathe. Okay, we're going to frequently assess for respiratory status. We're going to do effective cough techniques. You know, it's going to hurt, so we usually give them, they have a lung pillow that they can grab and hold on to, do an incentive spirometer, monitor, maintain mechanical ventilation, um, monitor chest tube output, you're going to have a lot of output because what happens is you go in and you take part of the lung out and your body goes, whole oh, crap, you know, there's a, there's a part of us missing. Let's fill that space. Let's fill that void. So we'll keep on, um, producing fluid to, uh, to maintain homeostasis. So we have to get that chest tube. We put a chest tube in to drain all the fluid off. Sterile dressing changes. This is as sterile as we can make it. Um, we're talking about an open wound straight to the, the heart. So we want to make sure that we have sterile dressing changes. Early ambulation and nutrition. What kind of nutrition do you think these people will have? We're going to possibly have high protein, high, high carbohydrates. They're going to be using all their muscles and um, calories to breathe. So we're going to have to, ha they're going to, have to have some calories in them oh. and of course m emotional support okay they just had part of their lung taken out they found out they had cancer their lives have changed they have gone to from the breadwinner of the family to possibly being de well basically they could be looking death in his face so they're going to need all the emotional support to be you might not know what to say you know, but just being with that patient is very important. Okay, I believe this is the last slide for this for uh, this part of the lecture. Let's see what we can find out about the next lecture. Okay, guys, let's talk about disorders of the pleural or chest trauma. This is a really fun, well, fun for me, not so much for our patients. But anyway, I think this is a really interesting topic. Okay, pleuritis, inflammation of the pleura. Remember we were talking about the how there is some nice fluid in between the lungs and helps it move? Well, guess what? Sometimes it gets infected. Just kind of like pericarditis, we can also have pleuritis, okay? Um, usually secondary to viral respira respiratory illness, pneumonia, or rib injury. I haven't really seen any rib injuries, but um, the respiratory illness definitely. Very painful, very painful, and you can hear the pleural fr friction rub, okay? It's sharp pain aggravated by deep breathing, cough, coughing, and movement. Rapid, shallow respirations, limited of chest wall movement on affected side. Really painful. Um, a lot of times when they get it, it does feel like cracked ribs because that's how painful it is. People don't understand how they get it. I had a employee of mine. She was only 15 at a time. She ended up with pleuritis. Dad was a total douchebag, um, dropped her off at the hospital and left her, you know, well put it this way. She had like $5,000 on her because she didn't trust her dad. 
and she couldn't get a bank account because she was only 15. I mean, real bad stuff. She called and was sad. She called to say that she was going to be um, not in for work. I asked where she was and she said that the hospital that her dad dropped her off and she had pleuritis and she didn't know how she was going to get home. Well, guess who took her home? Because I was bold. Oh, this is being recorded. But anyway, by the way, I didn't say douchebag either. Anyway, um, next, diagnosis and treatment. If it's a viral infection, there's really nothing we can do. We just have to let it go through the steps. Um, sometimes they try to give antibiotics, but I don't think the antibiotics are going to work um, because of the fact that, well, hey, it's a viral, not a in a bio, it's not a bacterial thing. Pleural fusion, it's about 20 to 25 milliliters of fluid in a pleural space. Okay, results from systematic or local disease, heart failure, liver or renal disease. So basically your fluid is backing up into your lungs and it's about 20 to 25 milliliters fluid in that, those little spaces. Okay, not really that big. It's significant, but not big enough that we're going to go in and retrieve that fluid. Um, when we try to go and retrieve the flu, we want big, va more vast amounts, you know, like we've done a thousand milliliters, you know, we might even do a couple hundred, but 20 to 25 is not big enough. Um, maybe described as transit, transudate, exudate, empyema, hemothorax, or cliothormax, compresses adjacent lung tissue. They have pain. They can't breathe as deep, so they're going to have diminished breath sounds. Dull percussion tone over effective area. Now, we don't percuss. The doctors percuss. And they generally see them on chest x-rays. There's a pleural fusion right there. But that looks bigger than a 20 to 25 cc's. Okay, treatment and management. We could do a thoracentesis, which we go in and take out the fluid but it's going to be a larger pleural fusion. It's not going to be 20 to 25. Depending on the cause, may need repeat drainage, chest tube, or thoracotomy. Um, we're going to do the same thing as for a thoracentesis, right? We're going to have, we're, it's going to have to be a patient. It's going to have to have a signed consent. They're going to be awake through the procedure. Um, afterwards, we're going to make sure that they don't have a pneumothorax. So we're going to make sure that they still are able to breathe. Their SpO2 is is doing well also, and that they're not their vital signs are basically stable. Okay, medical management. We're going to treat the underlying condition to prevent reaccumulation. So if it's because of um, a heart failure, we're going to treat that to hopefully it doesn't happen again. Um, problem is, it seems that once it happens, it will continue to happen but that's another day. Installation of talc into pleural space to form adhesion of the pleural linings is another way. I hear they don't do that very much anymore, putting talc in the pleural space. Um, it got to be a little dangerous, so it's not a, that's not a procedure we do often. Pneumothorax. So it's accumulation of air in a pleural space. This could be because of a penetrating trauma um, or it could be because of interogenic causes. And the interogenic causes is we basically caused it. We'll get in there. But pressure gradients in the thoracic space are vital to the process of breathing, of course. Um, air enters the pleural space, equalizes the pressure of gradient, impairing lung expansion, leading to lung... Okay, so a spontaneous, there's a, what they call blebs, um... In your lungs just like little I want to say lesions but what happens is sometimes they pop maybe you cough and they pop and it sticks to the lung causing a pneumothorax a collapsing of the lung um, primary effects healthy people secondary with people with a pre-existing lung disease so they could have a pneumothorax like maybe a COPD or or trying to think of anything else, maybe emphysema. Um, traumatic, open penetrating air from the environment enters closed. So like an open would be a gunshot wound, um, a stabbing, 
or maybe you were in a car accident and something went into your body. That would be penetrating air, okay? Some it open it's an open wound that something has gone into it. Um, a closed blunt air f from lung enters, so that would be uh, I keep on having to say fights. Uh, let's not say fights. That's so negative. So let us say uh, you were clumsy coming out of a movie theater and you fell. Your hands were in a pocket, so you couldn't catch yourself on the ground. So you went boom right on the ground, right onto the sidewalk, maybe the step and you bruised some ribs and hence maybe even broke a rib and it um, punctured your lung. Could be it, right? And there's aerogenic laceration of the pleura through procedures. So that's like a lung biopsy. We went in and we punctured the lung and maybe we made it too big or maybe it was a pacemaker um, that we put in. Anything to that, that it's something we cause, it's like a side effect, okay? Then you have the tension pneumo, where air entry through the chest wall or airways unable to escape rapidly accumulates and impairs function of the vital organs. Now, it's kind of interesting. So you're driving along and you just got out from the store. Let's say you were at Dollar Tree and there is an accident and you see a lady and she has a sucking chest wound. She was in a car accident. Steering wheel went through her. No, that would be maybe a guardrail, something. Think of something gross. That's what punctured her. What do you think you have that you could possibly help that lady? Because at this point in time, we want air to be not to come into the wound, but we want air to be able to escape from the wound so that the lung will stay hopefully it doesn't collapse so what do you want to use would you use the paper towels you just bought from dollar tree i don't know if you'd want to use paper towels you bought from dollar tree somehow i think they're pretty cheap but anyway or would you use i don't know a paper from the notebook that you just got from dollar tree maybe cotton balls what do you think you would use for that open penetrating wound how about that plastic bag? It, it, what we want is something impermeable, okay? And we'll go into a little bit further, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that bag and we're gonna cover the hole, but we're only gonna cover three sides of that hole. And we'll show you what it means. But anyway, I'm kind of like doing the house thing where you, can, you look around to the stuff that you have and that's what you use, okay? Okay, spontaneous pneumo, manifestations, depends on the size, extent of the lung, pleuric chest pain, shortness of breath, tachypnea, tachycardia, may have asymmetrical chest wall movement, hyper resonant to percussion, breath sounds over airy diminished or absence. Now remember, we're not talking about the whole lung. I mean, if it is a whole lung is collapsed, well, they're gonna be in a lot of more pain. But if it's just a little section of the lung, okay, you won't hear breath sounds over that section, okay? You could hear it on the upper um, lobes of the lungs, but not the lower lobes. So just keep that in mind. But they will have shortness of breath. They're gonna have pain, okay? Because that lung's unable to um, expand. Okay, traumatic pneumo, blunt trauma, motor vehicles, crashes, fall, CPR, fractured ribs leading to it. Open is the second chest wound, okay? Pressure equalized with the atmosphere and the lung collapses rapidly. Remember we were talking about um, in the video for crash course how um, air, the pressure gradient and how we need the different pressure gradients for the air, for oxygen to exchange with carbon dioxide. This really, really is detrimental to that. And then the iterogenic pneumothorax and that's why I explained earlier. Manifestations, symptoms may be masked due to other injuries. So you're coming in to the ER, you just hit a deer because, well, everybody seems to be hitting deer lately. 
and you're talking about chest pain, what what do you think they could be complaining about chest pain? They could be, you could be complaining because of the seatbelt that you're wearing that caused chest pain. Maybe your seatbelt didn't work and you went up against the um, steering wheel. So what they have to do is start doing a differential diagnosis to make sure to see exactly what's going on. And they would be able to see um, if the lung was collapsed or not. So you're going to have tachypnea, tachycardia. Well, hello, you were just in a car accident. Of course, you're going to have tachypnea and tachycardia. I mean, that's what we expect, right? Diminished chest wall sounds. Well, wall movement, I'm sorry. Well, that's a little bit different, right? Don't exactly expect that. Aston breath sounds. That's another thing we not normally expect, right? Um, air movement may be heard or if felt, if penetrating. And frequently accompanied by hemothorax. And what's a hemothorax? It's blood in the lungs. Tension pneumothorax. Injury to the chest wall allows the air to enter but not to escape. So you have the air coming in. Um, and of course that's going to cause a lot of problems, right? Because as the air comes in, it's going to move the organs to make more room. Okay, so pressure rises rapidly with each breath. Lung on affected side collapses. Pressure on the mediastinal shifts thoracic organs to an affected side, severely compromising ventilation and heart function. Medical crisis, very much a medical crisis, because not only do you have the heart, um, the lungs not working properly, but you're really dealing with all the thoracic organs and the heart function. So manifestations, regular sinus symptoms of pneumothorax plus hypotension, distended neck veins, and shifting of the trachea. The patient's going to be in shock. Okay, we're going to look at all those different um, problems, and we need to get them fixed now. Okay, treatment, and this is for any of the pneumothoraxes. Um, chest tube to allow for re-expansion. Okay, pleurodesis, creation of adhesions between the parietal and visceral pleura to prevent reoccurrence. Okay, using a chemical agent such as doxycycline. Surgical thoracotomy to resect and over sew blebs, usually found at the lung apices. Pleural roughen to induce adhesion scarring and to prevent future pneumothorax. Now, for test purposes, we're only going to really be talking about um, chest tubes when we talk about pneumothoraxes. Okay? And there's our chest tubes, and I'll bring some in the room. This is what's considered an atrium, okay? This is a chest tube, but we call it, it's like a chest tube with a flutter valve. So people that can go to, um, that I've seen a lot with the mesothelioma because they can go home with it, and they're taught how to uh, drain it. And this is a JP bulb. And there are chest tubes that are small enough for a JP bulb. Of course, this is after we get through all this um, because we're talking about 2,000, a little bit over 2,000 that we can grab from this chest tube. Okay, so we're, if we're going to get 2,000 out, we're definitely not going to use the JP bulb. We're definitely not going to use our little Heimlich um, flutter valve. Okay. I think I put on there about, yes, there is. There's a video on chest tubes that we can watch. Well, you can watch. I don't think you want me to watch you watch the video, so we'll go on. Okay. Nursing care of chest tubes. We want to frequently um, assess the respirations. If they are normal, if their SpO2 is, um, is within range, okay? Um, the atrium that I showed you has to be below the chest, okay? It can't be above the chest. Kind of like your... Uh, Foley bag. You don't want the Foley below the, the bladder. You want it, or I'm sorry, you don't want the uh, Foley above the bladder. You want it below the bladder. Check tube frequently for kinks and loops. Check water seal for titling if applicable. Assess water level in the suction control chamber. And I will have a chest tube and I'll explain that all to you. Drainage measurement, Q shift or as ordered. Okay, that is, well, in our facility, Drainage for the chest tube is the nurse's job, not the CNA's. You won't have that as a as an NCLEX question. Because some people would say that chest tube is it's real critical. 
So that's why they would want the, um, the nurse to do it, not the CNA. Um, let's see. Apply sterile occlusive petroleum dressing after chest tube removal or accidental displacement. Listen, you don't want to accidentally displace a chest tube. Chest tubes are sewn into the body with stitches and usually it's very tight stitching. Um, if you dis displace a chest tube, first of all, the patient's going to be pissed and in a lot of pain and in, in crisis. Okay. Um, we will go over what to do, what to expect with um, a chest tube. Do not clamp the tube. Do not milk the tube without a physician order. And I would say even with it, without it, with the physician order, I'd let the physician milk the tube. Dressing changes to chest tube site as ordered. We want to monitor for, site, for um, symptoms of infection to site. Okay. Chest trauma, rib fracture, risk for greater complications in elderly. Why? Because they're more susceptible to pneumonia, right? So they fall, they get hurt. They break a couple of ribs. It could puncture a lung or it could just hurt so bad they're not going to deep breathe. And since they're more susceptible to pneumonia, you know, this makes it a bigger complication. Okay. Severity depends on the effect of surrounding tissues, pain on inspiration, coughing, shallow respirations, crepitus. What exactly is crepitus and atelectasis? Crepitus, you would feel, feels like rice krispies under the skin. So it's air that gets underneath the skin and causes like, like it feels like rice krispies. Um, flail chest, um, could happen because of multiple fractures and paired chest wall stability, paradoxal movement. And when I say paradoxal mo movement, it makes no rhyme or reason why the chest is moving the way it is. Okay, like you expect it to go up and down. When they breathe in, you kind of expect the chest to go up. And when you breathe out, it goes down. Yeah, it doesn't really look that way. Dyspnea, pain. I'm sorry, yawn. I don't mean to. Dyspnea, pain, unequal chest expansion, palpable crepitus. Um, diminished breath sounds associated with pulmonary contusion. Treatment and care for ribs, fractures. Rib belts, binders are not recommended. Splinting, so we'd either give them a nice little lung pillow or we would take a um, blanket and tape it, okay, um, to help them whenever they get to go, you know, stand up or when they go to sit down or when they have to cough, anything like that. Pain control, deep breathing, um, flail chest, intercostal blocks, epidurals, very painful, okay, very, very painful. Oxygen, intubation, and mechanical ventilation. Pulmonary contusion. Um, where did I just hear about pulmonary contusion? Anyway, intubation and mechanical ventilation, therapeutic bronchoscopy, careful maintenance of fluid balance, invasive hemodynamic monitoring, frequent ABGs. These, these lungs took a real hard hit. Okay, they basically were contused, possible hematomas in there. Um, they, we are going to control that airway until the patient is feeling, not only feeling better, but the signs and symptoms are a lot better. Okay, we're back. Miscellaneous lower lung disorders. Go. Interstitial lung disorders. Um, so we have pulmonary fibrosis. <clears throat> Diffuse inflammation, inflammation of, or scarring of parenchymia, lung tissue, related to occupational toxin exposures or connective tissue disorders. So, we have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, hypoxic symptoms, characterized by ground glass um, symptoms, abnormal PFTs with regular reduced lung capacity, poor um, prognosis. Um, these guys, towards the end of their lives, they are on like 20 liters of humidified O2 and, you know, they're little, they're real skinny because they're having a hard time breathing. All their calories go for their breathing. It's really, really sad. Um, sarcoidosis, lung, chronic multi-system granulomatous, 
granulomatous motus, whatever, disease also involving skin, eyes, liver, kidney, heart, and lymph nodes. Highest risk in African Americans or those with family history. Um, and we really don't hear much about sarcoidosis. My mom was diagnosed with it at one point in time, but I'm wondering if that's really a true diagnosis. Okay, so pulmonary embolism. Remember, we will do the we will do heparin protocol, okay? Which means they will be continuously having heparin until their INR gets elevated enough that they can go home. Okay, so they will have the heparin. It will be going every after six hours. We're going to check the PTT of the heparin. We will also be giving them Coumadin because the heparin is going to keep their blood thin. The Coumadin's going to we're going to get the Coumadin on board to bring their INR up with the Coumadin, right, to keep their blood thin so they can go home on Coumadin. They can go home on a pill instead of going home on shots. Okay, so remember. Heparin, PTT, and with uh, Coumadin or Warfarin, it's INR. Coumadin, or the, we could do Lovenox, remember, if we want to send them home, we can do Lovenox twice a day. But heparin is so short acting, it has to be a continuous um, infusion. We got this? Maybe? Okay. So. Pulmonary embolus can happen from a DVT or from the right side of the heart due to a fin. Others are tumors, fat emboli, amniotic fluid, air um, embolus, IV injection of air, foreign body. Remember those catheter tips? That's why whenever we take out a catheter, an IV catheter, we say tip was intact. Okay, It's a medical emergency and it depends on how big of a... Um, Part of the pulmonary uh, has gotten, pulmonary artery, how big of the clot has gotten, how much it's branched off, okay? 50% of deaths in the first two hours following immobilization. Anybody watch ER? Remember when Lucy died? She died because of a PE? Well, that's the reason. Okay, so effects. Large pulmonary artery occlusion may result in sudden death. We did have a patient. She was gosh, early 40s, she had colon cancer, and she was going to die. You know, we were basically, she was at Barnes, Siteman Center and everything, and they told her there was nothing else they could do for her. And I remember um, Dr. Vaca, he was not the nicest person in the world, so we got along just fine because we're both East Coasters, but I um, remember him going in, and he was an excellent doctor, if not an arrogant Nobody's taping this, are they? So anyway, he went into her room because he used to be a hospitalist for us and asked, you know, what she needed. And he, I remember she said, uh, I want to go home. And he goes, well, it's Friday. We'll see about Monday. We'll see how you do over the weekend and we'll send you home on Monday. And she said to him, do you believe that Jesus heals? And Bach is a very staunch Catholic. You know, if you know, anyway, I'll keep my opinion about Catholics. I'm Catholic, so I can say it. But us Catholics, you know, we're pretty, pretty tight on our prayers. Um, in fact, I don't think we pray off the cuff. We have our organized prayers, but that's beside the point. Hope I didn't, like, blast any Catholics out there. But anyway, um, and he looked at her, and he goes... I believe Jesus does what he has to do. And she said, will you pray for me? And I remember him putting his hand on her head and he didn't say anything. And then he like tapped her shoulder and he goes, we'll see you on Monday. And he left the room. Now he was supposed to go right towards the nurse's station, but he went left because he got a little bit affected by that. He teared up for that, teared up for that, which Vodka doesn't tear up for anything. So anyway, we uh, turned around and he came back, asked me what the patient needed, what we could do for her. I told him, he wrote the orders and 
blah, blah. Went home, came back Monday morning, expected to have that patient, and she coded 20 minutes before we got there. Turns out she had a PE. She might have had a DVT from, you know, from her chemotherapy and everything. Um, she went to go to the bathroom. She was going back to bed, and that's when the PE moved on her, and she was unable to breathe. So 20 minutes before I got there, she passed away the day that we were going to send her home. I don't think there's been some deaths that really affected me that really affected us hard. Really did hard. But anyway, she had a PE. Um, because, of the, you know, the devastation that the chemotherapy does on her, on your veins and your arteries. Um, it can, you know, form blood clots and then they move and next thing you know they go into your um, your pulmonary arteries. Hers was pretty significant. Um, but anyway, significant portion of the smaller vessels can lead to a lung infarct. So just think about it kind of like a blood clot going to your heart. Okay. Obstruction of small segment of pulmonary circulation with no permanent lung injury. So if it's a smaller area, you know, you can bypass that area. Okay. Chronic or reoccurring possible multiple small emboli with reoccurring symptoms such as pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so you can have it chronically. would be going home with, obviously, some DVT prophylaxis. Okay, risk factors, same as a DVT, the vicros, triad, status of um, venous flow, venous wall damage, altered blood co coagulation. Prolonged immobility, trauma, surgery, MI, obesity, oral consumption, have to use estrogen therapy. Sound familiar? Manifestations, dyspnea, pleuric chest pain, impending doom. You remember I was telling you about that? Um, about you, how you can tell really between a respiratory problem and a problem with um, like an MI? You know, that impending boom, doom look on their face. Okay, cough, tachypnea, tachycardia, crackles, low-grade fever. Um, less common is diaphoresis, hemoptysis, syncope, or cyanosis, or the three, S3 or S4 gallop. Okay, so you might see hemoptysis. Not real that fact. Okay, so sudden onset dyspnea. Tachypnea, tachycardia, sounds like a regular um, pulmonary embolus, right? Confusion, delirium, decreased LOC, could be pulmonary embolus. We don't know. The difference is the petechiae of the chest and eyes. So you know what petechiae is, right? It's when your little capillaries burst. Well, you will have this on the chest and the arms. Okay, so who gets fat embolus? They usually come from large bones, when I say large bones, I'm thinking hip, I'm going to sneeze. Sorry. I'm trying not to. Okay, I'm good. Okay, large bones like hips, femurs, okay? Because you have the fat, fatty tissues, I would say, fat emboli around those areas. So what happens is you have a break like that and the fat molecules go in, goes into the um, into the blood and causes all kinds of havoc. They must be broke and they're long bone. Okay. I swear to you, you're going to see that somewhere. Diagnosis. Really, when it comes to a fat emboli, you're going to know it and you're going to see it. And we say get plasma D dimers and chest X C T VQ scan, pulmonary angiography, ABGs, and E ECG to roll out MMI. But when you're going into a patient and we will stabilize that patient before and we will treat them like a pulmonary embolus, like a fat emboli, and then we'll do a de definitive diagnosis. Okay, it's not kind of like, oh, I think you have a PE, so let's Let's take you down as we're still bagging you and get you a VQ skin. No. Okay. Some people get pulmonary embolus or I wouldn't say a fat embolus, but a pulmonary embolus and it hurts. Okay. Cause it's a smaller vessel that it's being included and we'll, we can do a VQ skin. But if I'm, if you're somebody that 
all of a sudden through a clot and have a pulmonary embolus, we're going to stabilize you first. Okay, so medication. We talked about this. Typically, we could do um, low molecular weight heparin, which is also known as low vox. A therapeutic doses for non-massive PE, or we could do heparin, PT, T monitored every six hours, drip, drip rate adjusted as needed, Coumadin started at the same time as heparin, requires five to seven days, usually become therapeutic, desired IMR between two and three. First time event, we're going to be on there for at least three to six months, and after that, we we'll probably be on there for 12 months. Okay, and then there's the antidotes. Right, been there, done that. Fibrolinux, we can give them the TPA. Problem is, you know, if they have a pulmonary embolist, we have to wonder why they got it. Was it because of a surgery? Was it because of a traumatic motor vehicle accident? If that is the case, then we're not going to give them the TPA, okay? Um, we're not going to give it to them if they're pregnant, okay? Intracranial bleed, any kind of stroke. So we have to be very careful. Surgical, we could do a thrombolectomy, which we can go through the femoral vein. Catheter is used to go up and take the clot, like a little claw. We can also put in a greenfield filter, which basically, if you have reoccurring clots, it's basically a filter that catches clots. Now, if you watch TV, what happens? Those greenfield filters can move on you. If you listen to Brown, Brown, and Crouppen, or whoever it is on that TV that's advertising a class action lawsuit. But guess what? It saves you from ha being um, basically a vegetable. Yes, they move. Things happen. But hey, um, I'd rather have it move and have it replaced than to have a CVA because of a because of an embolist. You know, it's kind of like that stupid commercial about taxidermy. You know, oh, you took taxidermy to for your breast cancer and now you don't have hair well let's sue them because you don't have hair but you have your life let's not be too grateful anyway a little bit pissy at lawyers i should be a lawyer but then i'd be pissy at myself anyway management we're going to frequent vital signs power positions with lower extremities dependent oxygen monitor coagulation studies monitor abgs bleeding precautions for extensive PE, hemodynamic monitoring, vasopressors for hypotension, central line, and art line. Okay? So, somebody comes in, you come in, somebody has a PE, you're going to definitely put them in a high Fowler's position. Okay? Because they're having breathing issues. Of course, you're going to put them in a high Fowler's position. You're going to give them oxygen. They're having a, we're not going to sit there and worry about a doctor's order. We're going to slap that oxygen on. You might have to put a mask on them because they're going to desat so much. Um, also, they're very frantic, so they're not going to be really breathing through their nose. They're going to breathe through any orifice that they can get a hold of. Okay. Monitor ABGs. We're not going to do ABGs every day or every six hours unless they have altered uh, level of consciousness. And we're going to watch ble bleeding precautions, right? Because we're putting the blood thinners through them so that, you know, the blood can get away around that embolus. Prevention, early ambulation, compression stocks, prophylactics, risk reduction during periods of immobility, avoid crossing legs, and regular exercise. Basically, your lungs have an increased arterial pressure, and it could be due for various reasons, okay? And it could be because that's just how your lungs are, or it could be because of the sclerodera, lupus, or HIV. We don't see very much of pulmonary hypertension, so I'll be honest if you have a test question on it. Okay. Well, I guess this is it. This is the last, the coronary. So, treatment and go 